Welcome to the Tormentor Radio Show on Radio Libertaire. In the vast landscape of alternative music, where experimentation is the guiding force, few bands have navigated sonic frontiers with the same boldness and innovation as 23 Skidoo. Emerging from the post-punk scene in late 70s London, the band carved out a niche for themselves by seamlessly blending elements of industrial, funk, world music and avant-garde, pushing the boundaries of sound in ways that were both visionary and unconventional. Their forays into sonic experimentation and their legendary live performances have earned them a reputation as worthy pioneers whose influence still resonates today. And today, we are very honored to have on the phone the co-founder of the band, Fritz Kathleen. Hello, Fritz, and uh, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Benjamin? I'm very fine, thank you very much. We just had a small musical section. I'm going to let Benjamin introduce us the three tracks that we just played. Yeah, before we begin uh, the interview, let me first introduce the two songs we played at the beginning of our program. The first one is The Gospel Comes to New Guinea from The Gospel Comes to New Guinea Last World single produced with the help of Stephen Malinder and Richard H. Kirk and recorded at the Cabaret Voltaire studio. This 12-inch single was the first recording for Fetish Records and released in 1981. Then the song Greguka from the EP Tearing Up the Plans released in 1982 and recorded just after the first LP 7 songs in the absence of the Turnbull brothers who were in Indonesia at the time to research and record Gamelan music. So we're going to start with a very early period, just before uh, everything started. What was at the time your background in music? What were you listening at the time? What did push you uh, to have this wish to start th this new project? Uh, well, I always loved music as a kid, and really we just we started as a kind of school band, you know, playing together just at school, and um, you know, just so many. Uh, we always had uh, all of us had really eclectic influences and that came out in in the music that we created i think when i was um very young uh, i had a little uh, this crazy little shortwave radio that i think my father had made himself and i can remember you know at night when i was meant to be asleep i'd be under the bedclothes tuning around and hearing all the crazy static noises and music from all around the world on this radio and i think that was probably a a formative influence um, but you know I always I always love all kinds of music essentially so there is no major it is also probably uh, what most of the people have in mind when they're trying to introduce your project is that it is quite hard to pigeonhole the project because of those so many and vast influences that we can feel the this project has its very own identity uh, we were looking of what kind of band we could approach to your band and there is almost none of those bands uh, maybe in in a way bourbon is cook but for the rest there it's quite hard especially that you are mm -hmm. never been targeted and even if it has been tried by many to push you into the funk and ethno world music Uh, you never really fit in that in that gap as well. So you, you you're completely out of every logical type of music style of music we could try to put you in. So it's always hard to mm -hmm. introduce your your music uh, without uh, playing it to someone that does not know your project. Was it a wish from the start? Mm. But I mean. Uh, well, no, I mean, I was about to say for sure, it was always, uh, we were kind of aware it was difficult for the people in the record shops to know which section to put the, put the records in, you know, beyond if, if it was the kind of shop that just had one small indie section in, obviously it would go there. But, you know, if they had, if they had, uh, if it was a 
more specialist shop, they wouldn't know quite where to put us quite often. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, th this heat were always a big, a big influence. You know, they they um, they were just fantastic. Late 70s, early 80s, if you saw them, and okay, they were they were a lot more. They had more songs. You know, it's almost like folk singing some of the style of of their songs, but um, the attitude and uh, you know experimentalism of them and can obviously as well was it was a really big influence in terms of you know bands from a generation before us maybe yeah but it seems for from many uh, listeners that the uh, experimental and historical background of music had always took uh, a big space in Eskidu uh, identity was it from the start the will to go into this experimental side of uh, the music or there, there was maybe a little period um, I don't know if you ever heard the very first single so there was a little a, a short period where everything was a bit straighter um, mm -hmm. but You know, we were always listening to all kinds of music, so um, you know, it didn't take long for us to um, realize we didn't just want to play, uh, you know, kind of uh, pop rock or whatever. Yeah. But um, I don't know. Do, do you know the very first single of all called Ethics? If you hear that, that's that's relatively straight. But even then, it has a kind of crazy clarinet solo that sort of suddenly goes jazzy. You know. Yeah. Um, Which is something that comes and goes uh, into 23 Skidoo's jazz uh, side of it. And it's, it's still still there after years, so it seems to be a major influence uh, for you. Are, you. are you and in the band listening that much to jazz? Yes, certainly. I mean, I, I probably like more trad stuff compared with the, the other guys, maybe. I, I, I mean, I listen to a spread, but um, I really enjoy some, you know, stuff from the 1930s. Mm. A real lot, you know? Yeah early periods mm -hmm. so did you have a clear idea of what you wanted to do uh, at the beginning or was it just uh, jamming and trying to see where it will bring you or did you have an identity in your head of what you wanted for 23 Skidoo how did you manage to organize that um, well I mean you know there's a, a saying that uh, definitely the Turnbull brothers from the band here the big martial artists would always uh, reference, which was that, uh, you know, Bruce Lee said, accept what is useful and reject what is useless, you know, but, ev you know, everything that you experience informs your practice, um, you know, and it's a mixture of, of um, you know, not, there, quite often there's a tendency to make out that any one person is, is you know, changed the world of their culture, but it's almost always any individual is just one stepping stone on the path you know everything that came before informs you um i'd say definitely in terms of yeah we were definitely more uh tending to jam and see what see what we meant to say afterwards you know i mean referencing william burroughs there was always that thing with uh you know in, in the cut up saying the future leaks through you know yeah so you do a load of random practice and then decide what You know, it's almost like a divination, what what comes out of it. So was it a systematic um, use of Burroughs' technique or was it just sometimes? Because um, you just say that it, it is a major influence on 23 Skidoo. Why and how much did it uh, influence the working process of the band? Oh, well, def definitely um, Tom Heslop, uh, when he does vocals, uh, uses cut-up technique for sure in coming up with the lyrics and on a wider level you know all the descriptions in burrows of you know tape manipulations was an influence as well yeah what kind of material did you start with because there are lots of tweaking and technological tricks if i can say it that way that are used uh where are you interested by that because There are techniques used by dubs and many different types of music that uh, we can hear in 23 Skidoos. How did you manage to combine all that together? Because it seems to be so many things put in into one only project. How did that happen? Was it, did you have lots of discussion with the band? Uh, 
regarding that the way you you want to sound or the way you want to work on on the next or, or a track how do you work really with all those uh, well i mean really it'd be you know kind of question of chance of if if somebody got a particular delay unit for instance then that that could really shape the sound there was a particular echo box that we had uh called the hh delay which had a sliding head oh. so you know the tape loops going around and you could you would change the delay time by actually moving a lever on the front of the delay unit and we were actually kind of doing almost like scratching the tape sometimes With that, you know, we found we could, you know, when, when when the bit of audio came back around to the head, you could move the head whilst it was going past and do some really freaky stuff with that. But so, you know, that, it, it, I mean, we, we very rarely did, you know, we didn't tend to sit down and say, hey, let's do a particular... I mean, in some instances we did, do you know, the, the live recording at WOMAD that was the record called The Culling Is Coming? Yeah. That was kind of planned the structure was planned in advance against particular tape loop sections that we were going to then um improvise other things over you know we knew what the structure of that that half hour was going to be before we played it live but mostly um you know it, it, things would be a little bit different every night there were various different periods really of of the band's practice you know that the probably the most exciting period was the kind of one and a half years around seven songs. Mm, yeah, the very beginning. Uh, and the, within that period, we were definitely just, fi you know, we were finding out what we wanted to do as we did it. I mean, another big influence was um, the group Last Few Days, who um, the, the, one of the key members, Dan Landin, who uh, was known as Stan Bingo when he did the live mix for Throbbing Gristle. Oh. Um, I played drums for them also for quite a their, their first period and um, their practice of making tape loops just within cassettes taking opening up a cassette and putting making a six or seven second loop within the cassette that was a big influence on us um, which again came you know through Throbbing Gristle and actually through you know practices of William Burroughs you know in the, in, in, there was a line of influence there And so a lot of the time we'd splice the seven second loop and then just keep recording onto the cassette until we had something that was a texture that we would like to use, you know, decide what we wanted to do. There were also techniques we would do with a, with a longer tape loop and a Revox or, you know, a, a reel to reel player where you could cover the arrays head with silver foil. Yeah. And that meant as the tape loop came round, it didn't get erased. Yeah. So the sound would build up on the loop, um, and that that was another technique that we like to use. It it was rewriting over the the existing sound. Uh, well, no, it would layer. So normally, when a tape loop goes round, there's an erase head just before the record head. Yeah. So normally, you would um, have new material going round on the loop if it's in record. Mm -hmm. With every rotation, but if you covered with silver foil over the erase head, it didn't wipe the tape. So what you, you know, as it came round, you'd hear it again, and then you'd hear it layered with the next bit of sound that you'd put onto it, and it would kind of build up. Kind of, I mean, do you know, uh, was it William Bozinski, uh, Degradation Loops? Do you know that? It's kind of the opposite of that. It's not wearing away, it's building up. <laughs> yeah, so it's more and more layer over and over. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, what was your uh, situation at the time? Because you start in a very rich period where lots of things was uh, starting and, and happening. You were in, in the middle of London. It was a period that we spoke of with many interviewers, people you, you know, like SPK, Nocturnal Emission, Bourbonus Quark all those uh, projects, they all spoke about the energy and the period with uh, squats at that time. What was your way of working at the time? Were you uh, also in London having a squat um, and organizing event? Or how was the early life of 23 Skidoo? Uh, yeah, well, various, uh, there was, you know, but living in squats was, was uh, definitely part of all of our, all of our youth. Um, but, um, I mean, it, it was just an amazing period. I was very lucky that um, kind of instead of going to college, I left school and went and worked in a record shop. 
which again to overuse the word eclectic was probably the most eclectic record store in London because it both did what you call chart return so it was one of the ones that compiled the charts for the really mainstream music so all that came through from the major labels but it also sold all the you know the post punk but also sold uh, reggae and dub import records jazz funk and soul import records and even had a small world music section at that time that was really unusual most uh, mostly you could only buy a few world music albums in a sort of subset of a, a one store in the middle of the town that sold African music. Hmm. But mo most stores, there wouldn't be any at all. Or maybe, you know, two things, you know? Yeah. So I, I was kind of lucky that I was spending all day being able to just put on record after record and find out about all this music. Also to get an understanding of both how the independent sector was working at that time there was a saying you can sell a thousand of anything so if you could you know build up a little fan base and have low production costs people were you know be able to make a living in a way that um is a lot harder now you know with, yeah. when people have been accustomed to uh, you know all music just streams for free or you know yeah yeah okay. for a, a small subscription fee and the, the, the whole I'm sure you're very aware the whole kind of revenues available to the kind of smaller level artists just doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Sadly, you know, digital age has uh, changed all the rules about um, the way uh, music uh, is consumed today, and not always in the, in a good way, um, I must say. But um, this, is, this is another long subject. Mm -hmm. so at the same time, when I'm when I'm able to just um, you know somebody sends me a file online, I record some drums for them send it back the same day you know it's <laughs> it's um you know they'll be obviously we're all enjoying the advantages as well yeah of course of course uh, especially our, our, all uh, our people working with the uh, technical tools it has improved uh, quite drastically the latest uh, two or three decades um, but um, mm. coming back to your, your period of uh, working how did you plan working on studios at that time did you just say okay we're gonna go a few days or a few weeks in, in studio and this is the plan we we have in mind or you just rush into studio and with no plan or did it change each time uh yeah probably probably changed each time i mean we we never had the luxury of weeks in studios at all um you know always on small labels with a, a limited budget so um you know uh, again we were lucky to work with some really wonderful people um like cabaret voltaire as you mentioned you know that was one of our, of our that was our first time I mean, again, that was kind of their home studio. It wasn't a truly professional set, you know, commercial setup. They had very good equipment, but it wasn't a kind of commercial setup. But, uh, you know, it was really amazing for us going and uh, staying with them and hanging out in Sheffield. That was a, uh, you know, Sheffield was a really great place politically at that time, very left wing and, um, you know, a nice environment and a lot of things going on. Um, and they were really great. But there was a phenomenon, I would say, that I don't know how if it exists to the same degree now, that at least in the more kind of left field area of music, there was no gatekeeping. Everybody was happy to share technique and experience. Yeah. So, you know, just uh, everybody was so helpful to us, you know, and I, I hope we kind of mirrored that to, you know, younger people coming coming up that um, that we'd encounter as well yeah so it's time to take a first musical break with three songs first kundalini and i y from the debut album seven songs released in 1982 on fetish records the album seven songs was recorded and mixed in three days and co-produced by tony terry and david a humorous pseudonym for genesis peerage peter christopherson and ken thomas uh, seven songs went straight to number one in the independent charts in February 1982. The third song is Last Words, uh, with lyrics inspired by William S. Burroughs, one of 23 Skidoo's most popular titles, taken from the Gospel Comes to New Guinea, Last Words single, and also available on the compilation Just Like Everybody, released in 2008. <laughs> Thank you. 
You're listening to Tormentor Radio Show. We continue our interview with Fritz Kathleen from 23 Skidoo. So we were just uh, starting to approach the way you were working in, in studio at the time. We just uh, understood that uh, your first album was recorded quite fast. How did you manage to do that in three days? Did you have already everything planned in, in your head? Oh, how did you manage to do that? Uh, no, no, not absolutely. But I mean, you know, we, we, we most of the tracks on that album were, you know, staples of our live show at that time. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think we did so many takes of them. There, I mean, one of the tracks on that album uh, called The Last Testament, I have a, a record deck that can play at 16 revolutions per minute. And we just put The Gospel Comes to New Guinea on that, you know, so playing at 16 instead of 45. Mm. And it sounded so incredible. That's one of the tracks on it. So obviously that didn't take too long. Um, <laughs> but the other stuff, uh, you know, I, I mean, really that album, you know, Ken Thomas was just an amazing, you know, he, he's, he's passed now, sadly, but... He was an amazing sound engineer, just really, he knew all the techniques and was really, really, uh, had great ears and, you know, shaped the sound very much. I'd say the influence of um, Genesis and, and Sleazy was more actually just that uh, Jen brought down a, a flight case full of effects units that, um, that we used on some of the tracks. So, that, you know, there's an influence, a sort of technological influenced that way but they didn't actually they weren't there for the three days i think they they maybe stayed one night or maybe jen did but um you know really it was a lot more down to what we wanted to do anyway and to um and to ken thomas i'd say how that how that record sounded yeah it seems like ken, ken thomas did understood right away what you wanted did you have to explain to him that or was it just a feeling because uh, he's known to be uh, working with many famous and mm, less famous people but uh, with the queens or uh, david bowie public image limited the bongos test department of of course club de Villa, um paul dries cocteau twins Uh, Sigur Rose, for example, many of those bands. Mm -hmm. How did you? Uh, well, there were some. There were some credits there. There were some credits you said there that I, I wasn't aware that he'd done. But um, yeah, I mean, he he was just you know he had open ears and he had an open mind, mm. you know. So there was, you know, he just liked what we did straight away. Tried to understand what we wanted to achieve and help us achieve it. It was a great marriage, if, if I can say that, it that way. It's, it's, um, because the result is still uh, relevant today. Huh? Um, I must say, I've, I've replayed most of your uh, albums and, and, and tracks of my personal collection the last months. And um, I think it's kind of, uh, especially that album, it's out of time. It's a timeless uh, album. You cannot really refer to any decades or, or, or whatever, even if you understand the technical evolution since, since the, the record of that album. But um, that might be also the, the interest of uh, seeing you live, because uh, what we didn't say uh, for the moment is that 23 Skidoo is a live band. It is really made for, for live. And I don't know if you played in, in, in France, so that's a good question. Um, but I, I think it's something that uh, is really made for, for, for live. Are you still touring uh, lately? or We haven't actually done anything sort of since, um, since all the COVID restrictions and everything. Mm. And actually, the, um, you know, the Turnbull brothers, you know, their parents were both artists. Mm. And they, they're dead now, and they actually, a lot of their energies is uh, are, are put into administering their parents' art legacy, you know, so they have yeah. shows all over the world that they have to help arrange and everything. Uh, also, Alex is in the middle of making a, um, a documentary TV series about um, street culture's intersection with fashion um oh, okay. so there's no plans at the moment for future live shows but it may happen we played together uh, oh i guess 
this four years ago now at the 100 Club in London. But uh, yeah, we haven't done anything for quite a while live. Yeah, I think it's the last video that I could found on, on YouTube, uh, some extract from your latest uh, show. Uh, that was after the release of the last album, Beyond Time. But mm -hmm. we're coming back to the early periods. What did change between the first album and the second album? Because you had already made your experience and your your focus on stuff. What did change into the, especially the recording uh, section and the working process uh, between those two's albums? So you mean between seven songs and The Culling Is Coming? Yeah, exactly. Is, is those the two you mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, The Culling Is Coming, one side of it was live at the WOMAD Festival, which, um, you know, is, it's a yearly big thing now, but that was the first one ever that um, actually Peter Gabriel lost so much money on that, you know? Um, yeah. uh, they didn't maybe quite understand the logistics of bringing so many big troops over, you know? But, I mean, it's a fantastic, um, fantastic event to be able to go to you know see the Burundi drummers for instance um, but um, so one side of it was live at that and you know we made a conscious decision to do a heavily atonal noise industrial performance rather than be you know try and sound like ethnic music so to speak yeah, yeah. for that performance but the other side of it we went with a mobile eight track to a place called Dartington College in, in Devon in the UK, where they have a, a whole uh, gamelan orchestra. And, uh, you know, we just kind of experimented with and found some sounds on it. Obviously, we weren't gonna be able to play the intricacies of true gamelan music, but we loved the tonality so much that we, we just decided to see what we could do. So again, very experimental, really. Which uh, is uh, still uh, an amazing album to listen to today. Yeah, well, the contrast between the gamelan side, which is just really, really soothing and gentle, and the, uh, the actual aggression of the other side is kind of is kind of quite a nice thing. You know? Exactly, and we can see also the the will of not being pigeonhole and the world music, but still introducing a lot of experimental sides uh, in it. Probably also uh, in a way in some. Um, lots of influences, but um, th that came uh, maybe it's more in seven songs. But uh, I have reheard all those lately and uh, see a pre uh, hip hop thing in your way, probably because of the technique you're using uh, with samples and echoes and stuff. But you're already opening a new door at that time. Uh, mm. Oh, well, that's, that's nice of you to say so, but I mean, with You know, hip hop was already coming into existence yeah. kind of 81, in fact, just, you know, but yeah. it was it was it was hardly heard over over in London at that point, you know, yeah. um, I mean, it's interesting, um, I guess, you know, Coup is the one that really, you know, we heard that Fab Five Freddy, for instance, really loved Coup when you heard that. And there's that kind of, I mean, everybody was excited by samplers when they first appeared, you know? Yeah. Um, there was a device called the AMS that only did about one and a half seconds, but that became a total staple, actually, of pop production as well, in terms of uh, making the sound really solid and repetitive. But um, I guess we used that a tiny bit on Coup, but a lot of Coup was, was editing, actual editing tape, in a way. I mean, you know, we... I'd said before about us kind of scratching the delay, the delay playback head on a, on, a, on a tape echo box. If we had thought of scratching on records, <laughs> we would have been so pleased with ourselves. <laughs> so when we heard that technique, it was kind of, oh, wow. <laughs> you know? We were very there. impressed by those yeah. sonic capabilities. I mean, personally, now I'm really bored of sampling and loop pedals and all the all the stuff you would think I would just love I'm now I'm kind of I just really love actual musicians playing together and the more it's fooled around I mean you know s s some manipulations excite me but generally um, you know I tend to listen to uh, older music where it's just about players playing together you know yeah um, interaction and doing that people. unique thing yeah. of Yeah, because when when people play together, it's almost like they're all talking at once, but all able to hear each other at once. 
Yeah. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of conversation yeah. going many ways at the same time. So mm. there's nothing more magic than that, actually, in all the possibilities of technological intervention. Even though, you know, we're kind of, it's almost like we're hardwired to be excited by something that we never heard before. Mm. You know, so that's, it's always going to be exciting if you hear a new thing, but... I mean, geez, I don't want to hear another vocal with auto-tune on it ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that one as well. How did you respond to the uh, quite fast success that you had at the early stage of 23 Skidoo? Did you imagine it could go that, that fast? Because you entered the charts quite fast, uh, especially for an experimental, if I can say that it that way, uh, band from the side uh, that has been linked uh, with all those uh, other uh, strange bands like Throbbing Gristle, Cabaret Voltaire, and, and so on. So how did you react to that Im impressive success uh, right away? Uh, well, now I realize how naive and stupid we were because we totally shied away from it and were, you know, through every obstacle in the way to us actually capitalizing on it. <laughs> and now, you know, I realize, oh, if we'd actually said, okay, we've got this great opportunity, let's try and write some memorable songs <laughs> that people might want to listen to in 30 years. Uh, you know, we might actually have some income coming in from the past now, but as it is, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, obviously, I don't, of course, you know, regret Rianne, but, um, you know, it's, it's <laughs> with, you know, with, with the time and maturity, you realize how kind of you were a, a, what we'd call a snotty teenager, we say over here, yeah. you know, we just yeah. kind of, don't tell me what I am, I'm going to go, I'm going to be the opposite of what, you do, what you're telling me I am, you know? Yeah. Um, and so there definitely was an, an, an element of that. Your albums have been repressed uh, many times and it, it is still the type of project that you can play almost everywhere on the planet. Um, you were speaking of Africa and world music early on, but it, it's typical uh, the place where your music could have also listeners quite easily, which might have not been the case in the early periods in Europe at, at the time, because you were so in advanced out if i can say it that way mm. did you try to go to other countries or continent like africa or asia to to play do you see uh no we i mean as i said really there was only a kind of one and a half year period of being mm. in a way a full-on proper functioning group um the turnbull brothers were kind of always as invested in their martial arts practice mm. as their music practice i would say so there would be you know a whole year where we didn't do anything because they were concentrating on that and so in terms of actually having a larger body of work that was one of the stumbling blocks to that i would say i mean um to be fair to them also i had a bunch of health problems that made things difficult for me at various periods as well so um You know, it, compared to a lot of other groups, we didn't say, oh, we don't exist anymore. But there were often quite long periods where, where nothing was recorded or released and we didn't do any concerts. Mm. So, um, yeah, we didn't, um, you know, so we, we never played in America even, let alone more obscure places around the world. And as you pointed out before, we never played in France. Yeah, I think the only time we went to France, we went to do a TV show in Paris where we mimed a performance behind Nena Cherry. <laughs> wow, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> What was the link <laughs> with, so, with all that? Sorry, how, how come we were asked? Um, uh, we were, well, we just, we, we knew her and her husband and they just said, oh, come and do this. Um, yeah, no, it's actually quite amusing that the song started with a really crazy drum roll. And I actually managed to really look as though I was playing it. <laughs> They were a bit surprised by that. But then there was a rap in the middle of it. And Nena couldn't actually lip, lip sync her rap. So she had to come and dance behind her drum kit and hide when it came to the bit of a song where she was rapping. Um, but uh, yeah, no, that was, that was fun. But I, I, you know, we never actually performed in, in, in France. Crazy, but true. Completely weird, knowing that uh, France, uh, especially at that time, was quite uh, 
big fan in, in jazz and African music, of course. Mm. So, so it seems not logic. I was wondering why um, when I was looking through internet and I didn't find now no why any infos on your life. But this is something that uh, I hope uh, will happen one day. Mm. Um, well, um, uh, one factor is that actually we never had management ever. Oh, okay. So you know. Um, We hooked up with the with record labels, but never had management. So a lot of things maybe would have been kind of more coherent, you know, in retrospect, if we had. But uh, yeah, that was the case. So, uh, Fritz, you know what's not going to mimic a drum roll behind an energy? It's the titles we are going to play. And let's discover more songs from 23 Skidoo with the track J2 Contemplation from the second album The Cutting Is Coming, released in 1983 on Operation Twilight for UK and Les Disques du Crépuscule for Europe. The first side is a recording on a live performance with the WOMAD Festival, which featured, among others, the Burundi drummers, les musiciens du Nil, and a whole host of musicians from around the world. The second side of the LP features Skedu's exploration into gam Gamelan. Then, one of the most commercially successful records of the band, Coop, taken from the 12-inch single of the same name, released in 1984 on Illuminated Records, with the famous bass line played by Peter Sketch Martin and stolen a few years later by the Chemical Brothers. Finally, the dark funk song Fuck You GI, 23 FPM, from the third album Urban Gamelan, also released in 1984 on Illuminated Records. Fuck You GI was actually later remixed to become the more club-oriented single Coup. This third album is about the last work experimenting with Gamelan rhythms and scrap metal.
back to Tormentor Radio Show with Fritz Kathleen from the British pioneer band 23 Skidoo. So we're now going to uh, go uh, deeper into this year, uh, 84, because there was quite lots of things happening on your side. There were three maxis, this uh, new album coming out, uh, Urban Gamela, we just slightly spoke of just before. We can see on the cover of that album also the love for martial arts, and it's also way further uh, from what has been heard before, um, maybe a bit more opened, like almost each album of 23 Skidoo, it's opening a bit more each time, if I can caricature it that way. More derby sides, how that happened uh, at the time? How did you come to that uh, result? I think also we had a period, you know, we had a period of, uh, you know, being more atonal and industrial. But then actually that scene in the UK, there was something a bit sort of stagnant about it. And also there was a kind of, you know, some of those bands were flirting with kind of right wing attitudes, yeah. you know, that we found very unappealing and uh, maybe felt that uh, we didn't really um, want to be associated with them so much you know and yeah. also you know so there's still plenty of experimentation going on but uh, maybe we we sort of fell back in love with actually playing the instruments too you know yeah from just do, we had a period where we, we we might do a show that was just tape loops and manipulations sonic manipulations you know and, and no music at all And so we, we kind of realized, well, actually, we really like rhythm and making, making some, some noise with real instruments, too. So kind of veered back that way. And that album was also repressed because we didn't spoke about labels yet. I must say that some of the album I was missing. I had the chance to complete my personal collection with... Uh, the re-edition that was done by LTM mm -hmm. in, the, in the early 2000 to, to 2010, I think, mm. around that. Some were even came out as double CDs. And Urban Camilla is something completely out of what was going on at the time. You were going into something more dubby, still experimental, but more world's music, I could say. Did you manage to see that the response from the public about that? Because it was also a, a period where lots of stuff was coming from, from Jamaica, from Africa. It was more popularized at the time. So how was that the response of the, the public when that album came out? Uh, I don't I don't actually think it got it. I don't think it sold so well, actually, that one. Um, I mean, the, you know, the, the 12-inch coup did really well. But that was kind of, you know, going a whole load more towards a straighter dance track. Even, I mean, even though it wasn't, mm. you know. <laughs> mm. But, it, you know, it, it could be the weirdest track that a DJ would play in a club that night. You yeah. know, they could get away with it. But, um, yeah, at, at that period of time, you know, they, we would get a bit of coverage in the press. But um, maybe the heyday of experimentalism was always already dropping away by the mid-80s. You know, the real... It was the period out of punk, you know, so 78 through to kind of 82 yeah. in, in the UK, at least. That was the maybe really exciting period of people had the punk attitude, but knew they didn't just want to play, you know, guitar rock. And the, the combination of those things led to many, you know, very interesting bits of music being made. So, yeah, by... by 84 maybe just, just the interest in what we was doing we were where we, we were at was kind of dropping away a bit i'd say so there wasn't a massive response to it was it because uh, england was really going into that uh, new romantic new wave type of music at that period or mm -hmm. going yeah, to no, there, there was a kind of a sort of a thatcherite element to um what was uh, wh what everybody was being interested in And even on the more alternative scene, by then everybody was kind of chasing after corporate sponsorship for yeah. their events and so on. I mean, what was really fascinating for me was in 1983, doing the tour through Eastern Europe, playing for Leibach, and um, just seeing how in all these places with hardly any money for culture, there would be, you know, in a small town in Poland or Yugoslavia, 
there would be a musicians club, an artists club. There would be all this culture happening for the sake of culture, not because it was anybody was going to get rich or was getting, you know, sponsorship from a big vodka brand or something like this, which is where London had become by then. That was what was important as who, who you could get to pay for your event rather than what the event even was almost, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that started to announce a quite long pause for Skidoo at the time because there were some Maxi coming out just a bit of after that in 86. The the one was uh, Assassins with Saul and mm. the, the 400 Blows that same year. And I think the last one is uh, Sulfuric Beats from 88. And then it was like mm -hmm. no news at all. Like you, you did disappear completely. Um, mm -hmm. until the early 2000s, so it's quite... That's right, yeah. yeah. Quite a long time. Well, well to 20, 20, uh, we had a slight falling out with Genesis Peorage. We were subletting the rehearsal room, you know, that um, Throbbing Gristle had used and recorded in a lot. Um, and they, when they weren't doing anything, we'd kind of made it our space, really. And then when Psychic TV got going, they decided they just wanted it for themselves, even though we'd done loads and loads of work making it a much more pleasant um, environment to be in. And so we lost our rehearsal space and decided to get a little, um, you know, home eight track studio together at Alex's house. Mm -hmm. And sort of through that, we drifted in and pretty much became this other entity called Ronin Records that did sort of early UK hip hop. And we also did a whole load of remix work, you know, for, actually for some quite, you know, Sade, Stevie Wonder, Seal, some quite big acts, you know. Yeah. Um, and also actually some, some adverts, you know, the sound for, for adverts occasionally as well. So we had this sort of became this production studio entity more than, you know, an artist releasing stuff, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then the Turnbull Brothers, you know, started the, the re record label as well. And there was a whole load of um, early UK sort of breakbeat and hip hop stuff that happened on that label. But none of it was branded 23 Skidoo, even though we probably still brought brought some of our you know our sensibility into everything we did there as well yeah yeah i, th I think it's something that uh, can be heard um in that label what happened was it because the turnbull brother were working on the label that uh, you didn't uh, feel like you wanted to release a, a new album because for the people seeking through internet they will have like 12 years with nothing and then came the re-edition of uh, gospels come to new guinea with school by ronin mm. record so it's a, a, a re-release just before you decided to released that um, I don't know if I can call it a compilation because it's not completely a compilation that album that have the same name the album 23 Skidoo uh, signed on Virgin Records in 2000 at that time first of all why Virgin Records and it seems so far away far away from what you were doing and uh, what pushes you to well, To release that one well really just because they wanted to oh, virgin offered to pay for it and wanted to do it um i guess there was loads of other stuff going on i was kind of practicing my um studio craft as a sound engineer and mixer actually with a go do you know a producer called william orbit do you yeah. know who he is at all yes of course okay so he I, I, I did a load of work in his studio kind of as a sound engineer and doing a few remixes for him and stuff like that. We were all doing different things as well. As I said, the, the Turnbulls were always spent a lot of time actually on their martial arts stuff, you know, teaching as well as, as doing it. They both did teaching and travel a lot. They traveled a lot. And I, I always had other musical things going on as well. But just within that period, that was the focus, was doing this studio-based production work that kind of wasn't really 23 skidoo and i think possibly we had some contact to virgin from doing remixes for them we i think we said hey we've got a load of old eight track recordings of skidoo here are you interested at all in releasing that as a kind of retrospective thing 
and they said uh, actually we'll pay for you to do a new album uh, but also unfortunately around that time the Turnbull brothers uh, mother became ill with cancer and so they needed to kind of take out probably two or three years that we didn't you know we didn't do very much because they were looking after her at the end of her life you know yeah um so uh, sketch the uh, peter martin sketch um you know who did the he actually wrote the horn theme on coup as well as the kind of um actually no he didn't the, before you said he did the bass line actually so Johnny did the guitar line, which is the most me memorable thing, which is what the uh, Chemical Brothers um, referenced rather strongly on their track. Mm -hmm. um, and Alex did the bass line through the H um, Echo Box that I was describing before, mm -hmm. the very low bass. And actually Sketch's contribution to it was the horn thing, which on, on the Fuck You GI version, he did um, on a bass guitar. Okay. Um, but then we got the Aswad horn guys to play it as a horn part on Coup instead. But uh, yeah, me, me and Sketch and a couple of other guys had, um, we only, we never recorded, we only played live. But if you search really deep on YouTube, there's two or three um, performances by a band called Carlos Heinz and Hasegawa. And so that was what me and Sketch did within the period that Skidoo was meant to be doing the album for Virgin, but couldn't because um, of the Turnbulls looking after their mum. But uh, that was quite kind of, that was almost like jazz funk, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, amazing, uh, amazing Paraguayan guitarist called uh, Guillermo Hill played guitar with us, um, who is just fantastic. Um, but anyway, so you know, we never stopped doing doing music individually, but just in that period of time, kind of there, there wasn't the kind of impetus to do something for 23 Skidoo. Yeah. And then the, that last Virgin album, you know, that's the, I mean, it's 20, 24 years ago now. I mean, that's kind of the last real thing recorded as 23 Skidoo. Then maybe 10 years after that, at that point, I wasn't uh, playing live with them. I, again, I had some, some health problems and I couldn't play for a period of time. And so I didn't join in, but they did, you know, what you call kind of reunion shows, where it's, you know, my, my, they, they did one on the South Bank, you know, the prestigious big art centre on the south of the River Thames in London that was one of those ones where you recreate the album so they did one that was oh. um you know that pl replaying the seven songs album um and like i said I, I wasn't well enough to join in but i kind of i went and dug out some of the old um tape elements that um that i still had and they didn't have and sent sent them off to them to make it able them able to do it and, So uh, let's go back to music with five other songs. The first one is Ooze from the 12-inch single 23 Skidoo vs. The Assassins with Soul, released in 1985 on Illuminated Records. Assassins with Soul is one of the group's various guises, reflecting the increased influence of hip-hop on the band, who became involved with DJing, remix and production starting after 1984. The second song is Shrine from the second album the culling is coming then elephants and meltdown taken from the compilation just like everybody part 2 released in 2002 on running records running Records was founded by the turnbull brothers in 1990 the final song is retain control from pill session released in 2012 on the scottish label ltm and as its name implies issued from a session for john pill recorded in september 1981 
you are listening to Tormentor Radio Show. This is the last part of our phone interview with Fritz Kathleen from 23 Skidoo. So we just uh, spoke about the PL session, which is also something that uh, didn't came out, was broadcast, probably recorded and kept by uh, BBC at the time, Radio One in 81, but only came in 2012. And which is quite an interesting maxi, we could say, because there are only four tracks on, on that one. But that can clearly show the crazy work from that period, early 80s, and how Skidoo were sounding at that time live act, uh, which is uh, quite an amazing release. Why wasn't it uh, released before? Um, I'm not sure if it was actually that the BBC for a long time didn't release any Thing. And then suddenly they opened up their their kind of commercial attitude a bit and said that then said they would license the old recordings for other people to release. I think probably for you know the the 20 years after it was recorded, yeah, yeah. they just had a policy of you know just saying no if anybody approached them about any old recordings like that. Okay, okay. But um, yeah, definitely that track, um, really that period of time of the band, which was around when Seven Songs was recorded, but mm. was never really properly documented in terms of studio recordings. Yeah. You know, which is a bit of a shame because, you know, the, for me, that was the real heyday of the band when we were most concentrated was actually that period and with Tom and Sam in the band too. And obviously, I, I like a load of the stuff that we did later on. But, you know, it's, it, it's a shame that we weren't more um, focused on everything at that point. You know, with the advantage of age, I wish that we'd um, yeah. been more devoted to it actually at that time. But it made that album, uh, I mean, that Maxi as a must-have to get a clear image uh, of uh, how, how Skidoo was sounding at the time. Did you kept lots of records, from, uh, recorded session from you live at the time? Because this is something that wasn't that much uh, released by the band. Which is strange. Uh, well, we, we've all got a few cassettes, but they're not really good enough quality, you know, that you would think of releasing them. Very often people used to record from the mixing desk and actually then the balance is just terrible because you don't have the acoustic of the hall, yeah. you know, and the live sound coming through the air. And also just generally the quality of cassette players available that you could try and record live with then wasn't that great usually. Yeah. You know, very tiny microphones, so you get a really over-compressed, yeah. you know, bit distorted sound. So, you know, I've got some recordings, but um, they're not really, just just not really good enough to release to people. Okay, because in 87 came out a compilation, 23 Squidoo, just like everybody, that was re-released later on by Running Records and also by LTM as a double CD, part one and part two, um, which is also mm -hmm. quite an interesting uh, one. Reinterpretations of songs, lots of uh, unknown new tracks, some very, very short tracks as well. Was it a wish to have some very short tracks like that? What was the idea behind um, those, those tracks that uh, were... Because you have songs that are 28 seconds long, for example, or, or some that have... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they're more, they're more kind of interludes than songs, though, really, aren't they? Um, so maybe they got titled as a song, but um, yeah, I mean, just uh, that was a load of, of fragments and old recordings, um, really, that got added on to kind of give more than just putting out the existing version of that compilation again, you know? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, yeah, but, you know, so LTM Records does re-releases mostly, Yeah. for a lot of groups from that period and they're always saying how can we make this not just be the same thing pressed again you know so they probably yeah. had some uh, 
influence in in all the extra you know extra things going on that one yeah which is also a quite interesting one because it's it felt more like a kind of documentary on the band so which is something i, I can't uh, i can really understand um and i must say i'm quite impressed by the label's work on your project but also on lots of other uh, repressed uh, albums mm -hmm. But now came that uh, the last album uh, released Behind Times, which is one of the album didn't know of before I started to contact you. And I discover probably the, the one that I'd have play the most lately in order to get in the album I find it uh, a, a total accomplishment of the band and clearly resetting all ideas of Skidoo in one album all the different periods with some impressive ones I, I must say but that album has might be an interesting door to get in to discover 23 Skidoo's because you can see all elements of uh, Skidoo over the years the sound is also um, yeah I mean 2015 it's it's normal it's so updated that um, it brings something very uh, powerful to the, the, the music something very live I must say brilliant jazz uh, side uh, part uh, of it um, reinterpretation of some tracks like uh, Contemplation or Urban Gamela and the long long behind times track made by William Turnbull. What, what was the idea behind that? Well, I mean, re really, that's a soundtrack album, you know? So Alex made a documentary film about his father's art practice. So the actual film has that music as its background music. Most of, you know, it's mostly it's um, with images of artworks or with people talking over it. So, uh, and it just, it was decided to, uh, you know, release the actual soundtrack because we thought it sounded really nice how it all flowed together. But uh, yeah, it wasn't actually, you know, like a new project recording at all. It was some some old stuff, maybe slightly remixed for the film, and a couple of other pieces, um, you know, ambient pieces that worked as film sound. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's more logic. But I think uh, Benjamin has something. Yes, yes. Uh, we were talking about a, um, a particular instrument that the Turnbull brothers went to Indonesia to uh, to record, and uh, that particular instrument was part of the title of one of your recordings. It's a gamelan. So I just researched the instrument. It's quite a huge uh, piece of music. And what I would like to know is what uh, in that instrument uh, give you inspiration uh, to you, maybe and to the Turnbull brothers? Uh, well, just, uh, you know, we were always excited by um, tonalities and scales outside of the Western classical ones. You know, there's, I mean, the, the actual structure of how Gamelin works also is, is quite incredible because you'll hear one line and it's people playing alternate notes on the, on the chimes. You know, there's some, some drums and some flutes, but mostly a gamelan orchestra is tuned gongs and um, metal chimes. But if you hear a line that's going on the chimes, it's actually two people playing every alternate note and they'll hit the chime with a beater and then deaden it really quickly with their hands afterwards. So it's a very staccato, short note. I mean, this, this is in, in uh, Balinese gamelan. Javanese gamelan tends to be a lot slower and um, more kind of dreamy. Balinese gamelan is more is kind of more aggressive actually but yeah we just it was one of those world musics that we heard um, you know, when we were in our youth and just totally fell in love with and um, you know the Turnbulls because their family you know their mother's family was um, came from Singapore but also were kind of Malays Chinese so the whole you know just they had a particular mm -hmm. affinity to um, sounds from Southeast Asia um, And yeah, they, the, the Turnbulls brought a few in gamelan instruments back, but, you know, not a whole gamelan orchestra because that would be a whole freight container <laughs> to get it back here. Good, thank you very much. Uh, just one question about the label Fetish Record, which was your second label after Pineapple. Uh, mm -hmm. Fetish Records was founded by Rod Pierce. Mm -hmm. 
who also signed Clock DVS, Robin Grissel and Cabaret Voltaire. What can you tell mm -hmm. us about him and your experience with the label? Uh, he, he was just a great guy, really um, had incredible energy, um, you know, rode a motorbike. Um, that was quite fun. If you went on the back of his motorbike, you definitely <laughs> had a thrilling ride. Uh, you know, r really, really lovely guy. Um, uh, sadly, he he died. He was um, he was hacked to death in Mexico by somebody who wanted to impress a girl that he'd split up with. I mean, that's how fucked up the world can be. Another question is about uh, your uh, tour with the uh, last few days, as you told us. Uh, I read that you played drums for uh, Leibach. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the guys from Leibach came over to uh, London for the the big William Burroughs Final Academy event. Did you hear of that ever? That was in 1982. And we kind of met them there. And then I kind of, um, I, I had um, I'd taken a flight to um, Egypt that came back through Yugoslavia. And you could kind of stop off and not pay any extra for your flight and i just kind of turned up in ljubljana unannounced kind of um you know phoned them and said i've got to be there in four hours and um stayed with them and um you know at that time it was really unusual for them to get any visitors from the west at all um and we just became really good friends and when they did the tour with last few days they kind of organized the eastern side of it and um dan land in the last few days organized the, the gigs in the western countries and their drummer had, had left and they it just made sense for me to play for both bands um and then i i, I played a few more times with them we we um we put one really fun one was we played there's a, a english ballet dancer called michael clark who always did quite avant-garde performances with um people like lee bowery i don't know if you know do you know who lee bowery was he's dead now but that he was a kind of really crazy guy from the london club scene who kind of um He was an absolute spectacle. He, he kind of um, would paint at the top of his head as if an egg had broken on it and stuff like this and had the most fantastic, crazy costumes ever. Um, but anyway, he would be in Michael Clark's dance troupe and we played in London and uh, in Los Angeles as a sector of this ballet show. Um, mm. It was great fun with Leibach. Um, I saw their show in London about two months ago and it was they were really fantastic, really, really good. Uh, last question for me. How did you convince the legendary saxophonist Pharaoh Saunders to play uh, for you on uh, the song Downing? Well, I, d I don't know if he needed convincing. Um, <laughs> I, I wasn't actually there for that session. The Turnbulls flew out to New York and recorded him, but we couldn't. We couldn't afford for us to all go out oh. to uh, just for that recording, you know. But um, but uh, yeah, I think I think he was offered some money and he was happy to take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But he also he also played on the one on that 23 Skidoo album called Kendang. He played on that track as well. Oh, okay, okay. So he played on two. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So we now are going to speak a bit about that split album. We had the chance to interview Simon Crabb in Tormentor Radio Show. What, well, one year ago, something like that, I think, a bit less than that. How did you uh, plan that? And did you have already, because I was amazed by that album, I must say it's quite a brilliant album, brilliant oh, thank you. Co collaboration. I think, l like Simon, I like this uh, minimal dub uh, side of, of the electronic music. How did mm. you... How did you manage to do that? Was it a wish you had since a long time? You seem to be friends well, since well, a long time. Actually, no, because when, wh whenever the one time that Skidoo and Bourbonese Cock were in the same bill or in the same festival or something, and we saw them in the early 80s, they actually they had like a dead pig's head mounted on a microphone stand on the front of the stage. And this was just at the period that we were disenchanted with industrial music and we were kind of oh god no look at these guys they're trying too hard to be outrageous mm -hmm. and we'd never took them seriously and never listened to them at all in that period and you know when i listen back to their stuff now i really like it but i kind of just didn't take any notice of them in the early 80s 
And um, maybe 10 years ago, I moved out of London to a town on the coast called Hastings. And after I'd been there about three years, maybe somebody said, oh, there's this guy down here, Simon Crabb. You should really hook up with him. You know, you'll get on. And eventually we met up and um, yeah, he's a great guy. You know, I really enjoy his company. He's a very fun, fun man. Um, and, uh, you know, we ended up doing this project where he is kind of totally anti-analog technique and does everything in his laptop. And I'm kind of not the whole way the opposite. Obviously, I use digital technology, but I have, you know, a studio with a load of old analog gear in it. And I'm much more interested in originating sound through an analog, you know, from an analog source. So he will send me a kind of loopy beginning of, of something that he wants to get going. And then I'll send him back files of a load of live stuff with my kind of interventions of my studio technique. And then he'll do further interventions on my sounds with his digital technique in his laptop. And we sort of back and forth it a bit like that. And yeah, there's a really nice kind of yin yang between his kind of rather wonderful digital electronica sensibility to how he likes to manipulate sound and the things that I come with. So um, yes, it, it turned out really nicely and we were very lucky to get released by um, Vladimir Ivkovich on, on his Often Music label, which is again, wonderfully eclectic what, the, what they put out, just a really broad mix of different kinds of stuff from kind of nearly fields recordings to some kind of almost techno stuff. But um, yeah, he's, he, he runs a really interesting label. Do you plan to do something again together? Because it's, it is already the, the first question I, that comes to my mind. When I, I heard that album, I was really into that album and I just wanted more uh, almost right oh, wow. away. Well, yeah, we, we, we are actually, we're working on a load of new tracks. I'm not sure if Vladimir will release it. I think he doesn't normally release more than one thing by any art, one artist. You know, it's, it's kind of the yeah. way his label operates. Um, so yeah, if you know anybody with a label who, who'd like more of that, we're, we're on the way to completing a second one. <laughs> I'm sure there is plenty that will be uh, willing to do that. And we're going to pass the info. If any label is listening to you tonight, I hope that uh, they will get interest by that project. I urge them to listen to Bomb Culture, which is um, also... Uh, lots of humor in, 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 in that album. If you know a bit uh, the musical part of those members, uh, you, you will see. I think you, in, in listening to that album, I realized that you, you had lots of fun doing that. Is it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, um, the, our problem is actually. I'm kind of not very excited by doing a live show where I just play rhythm against a computer thing. Mm. And equally, I, I'm a bit skeptical about live shows where you don't know if the person on stage is really doing something or not. You know, they're looking at some devices on a table. So we, you know, it's not something that's easy. We, we did a few things where Simon did laptop and I did sort of percussion. Just before COVID, we do, we played in like Lithuania and Berlin mm. and Denmark. But I was a bit kind of dissatisfied with, you know, what it was like for somebody watching, just seeing somebody playing drums and percussion and everything else being off a laptop seemed, you know, not, not as all that interesting. So, um, you know, I'd like us somehow to do more live stuff, but I'm, we may do it more DJ style, little, you know, that we'll just play music that we like and play some of our tracks in the middle of it and maybe a little bit of laptop stuff from Simon. But um, yeah, I'm hoping that, you know, we'll be able to appear around the place doing that somehow or other. You didn't sort of uh, calling help to one or two musicians for the live part? Is that maybe... Well, the, the trouble is there's, there's not the money, you know? Yeah. People, uh, like I, I've got a friend called um, Dr. Das, Anna Ruda Das, who played with um, Asian Dub Foundation. And maybe 15 years ago, he was playing all over Europe, you know, every, every summer season. 
he would take five friends out with him and you know do music together and then the promoters started saying to him we just can't afford it we can't afford the travel and the hotels for this many people against what ticket sales will get could you just come and do a dj set and actually he didn't want to do dj stuff so he's now got a table of incredible freaky um freaky uh, effects units and rhythm generators that he actually makes some incredible sounds i mean you know i'm really impressed with what he does with it um it's not what i want to do personally but he's really taking it to some crazy places a sort of mutated um you know willfully non sort of straight rhythms he creates but it's fantastic at one point he just played kind of dub bass you know and he's just decided now he wants it to do it all from machines but as I say, essentially, the promoters are saying, yeah, we, do, we just can't afford it. So for us to, you know, we can't afford to pay for people to come and be the band, you know, ourselves. Yeah. We couldn't pay their performance fee, let alone the extra travel and, and hotels. So it's just so much isn't viable anymore at the sort of lower levels. That are, I mean, another factor is there used to be so much public arts subsidy money into performance. And, you know, the, the kind of uh, everything's just, um, you know, the idea of culture being something that's worth public money going into all over the world is, you know, it's, it's sad, really, because it made so much good stuff happen. And uh, yeah, now we're in the era of um, we all upload our whole life onto internet platforms for free. And um, yeah, but uh, nobody gets paid for anything. <laughs> I think it has been also uh, multiplied by this uh, COVID things and uh, the, the crisis that came uh, after mm -hmm. that. So yes, yes. People are now a yes, bit so, scared. Yes. So, so, so many businesses, yeah, so many yeah. businesses failed because because of the impact actually of COVID too, yeah. yeah the the short-sightedness of, um, of, you know, governments and local political bodies not putting money into culture when actually without them doing that, we end up, they're going to they're spend more time fighting crime, essentially, you know? Yeah, or uh, spending money for the next war. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. I think I think it's it might be uh, going on a, a few years uh, um, until someone realizes that uh, investing in culture is probably the best way to not having war. But it seems that many mm -hmm. people are forgetting that that uh, culture is probably one of the strongest uh, solution against against uh, throwing money out of the windows because war costs lots of money and does not bring anything but it seems to be the, the period we are going on but um, I just wanted to thank you very much for that interview we were delighted to have you uh, tonight um, on the phone and uh, I've learned quite a lot of things uh, tonight so and I w wish really Hard, really strongly that uh, there will be a follower to Bomb Culture. I'm sure it's going to be as amazing as this one and probably even more. And uh, we can now conclude this program with a last selection of five tracks. First, the three songs Ayo, Ambient, Calypso and Kendang from the album Beyond Time, released in 2015 on Les Disques du Crépuscule. This is the score for Alex Turnbull's documentary Beyond Time about his father's life and work. The last two songs are Umwelt and Warlords from the album Bomb Culture by Big Daddy, a collaboration between Fritz Katlin and Simon Crabb from Bob and His Quark. The album Bomb Culture was released in March 2023 on Often Music. Thank you very much for all that, Fritz. And, uh, well, thank you, Laurent, for asking me. Really nice to chat to you. You're welcome. Um, let us know whenever you have something new. Uh, you're having dates, uh, live dates. Uh, we'll be happy to speak of it, make some promotion. Oh, thank you. That's great. You're welcome. Talk to you, I hope, very soon again. Thank you. All thank, right. Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank Cheers. you. Bye. Bye. Au revoir.